Let's Podcast alongside Joe Giglio. I'm Joe Ovius inside the Eford Studios downtown Raleigh. Thanks to Empire Properties and thanks to Copiers Plus. Check them out online at copiers-plus.com. Get that print and document management assessment. You can save money. Money. Saving money is good. Joe and I, we, we actually <laughs> were talking about this before the show today. Man, we got to find ways to save money. If you're a small business like us, every nook and cranny matters. And they can help you out by getting your print costs under control. So again, check them out online at copiers-plus.com. So the Carolina Hurricanes, Joe, are going to cause chaos because that's their that's their slogan this year, but they're going to do so cautiously. I love this. This tracks with all of our conversations with everyone at the Carolina Hurricanes. And there's a way to look at these quotes just on paper and, and mm -hmm. think... That, you know, Rod Brindamore, Mr. Muscles on his toes kind of guy is is maybe making fun of this. But no, no, no. No, he's no, not. No. He's clear eyed. Yeah, quick. He understands. <laughs> this is a long race. No yes. one is sprinting here. This is a long race. October, while important, not as important as being healthy at mm -hmm. the end and being your sharpest in May. In June. So the Canes won last night, but they're the Canes are having a little bit of a roller coaster start to the season. Right? They haven't looked they haven't looked like this dominating team that people defensively. We'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to that. They have not looked like this dominating team that we were talking about at the beginning of the season. This carryover from last year being salty about the exit against the Panthers and everything else, and putting the hammer down. And last night was more of the same, where they had to rally against the San Jose Sharks. The San Jose, San Jose Sharks, that not a lot is expected out of them this year. Right. I mean, they're, they're a farm team for the rest of the NHL. They really are. Okay. So they found themselves at a deficit. They score four goals. The power play got going. But to your point, defensively, things have a little bit eh, not great, right? We talked about this with Luke Takak at the News and Observer yesterday when I asked him why the hell Jalen Chatfield's the seventh defenseman. When the Dimitri or the 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 uh, the Orlov Tony D'Angelo pairing has been kind of mid at this point, but it's the other concern to your point about health that's really got people kind of freaking out. Freddie Anderson takes a puck to the face to the face mask, a little wobbly. They take him out of the game. They put Auntie Ranta in, and we also come to find out before the game that Sebastian Ajo, my soon to be former neighbor, is dealing he's dealing with an upper body injury. They announced that just before the game. And here's Rod's exchange when asked about those two instances and how they're going forward with it. Not an easy situation with Sebastian Ajo missing yeah. the game, Freddie Anderson leaving early. What does that say about this group next man up mentality? Yeah, well, that, I mean, you got to just do your job. So even though those are, I mean, we don't have Svesh, we don't have Ajo in the game, we don't have Freddie, like, those are your best players, but it doesn't change what you have to do. It actually gives other guys some opportunities, and, you know, they relish that, and they did a good job. Is there any update on Frederick then? Yeah, well, I mean, you saw he took the shot to the head. And, it, you know, it, we, we're we in an age now for the athletes. It's everything is precautionary. And if it's even remotely, you know, oh, I'm a little dang, of course you are. You just took one in the head. It, it's, okay, see ya. We're pulling you out and we're going to, you know, make sure there's nothing wrong. And that's really across the board. I think we've done a good job with that. And that's what this was tonight. So that's Rod Birdmore, head coach of the Carolina Hurricanes, after their win against San Jose. And to your point, Rod's not being no like a dick Crow about this. No, he's like <laughs> back in my day because well, really we didn't wear helmets. What I mean, what is the story about the Carolina Hurricanes in their minds? What is their story with these postseason exits? All of the injuries and and really not having a clean look at this thing even once. So what are you going to do? You're going to take every precaution, which I applaud them for, and quite frankly, they have the depth. You know, we've seen this before. They they make adjustments in the playoffs without mm -hmm. their star players. Obviously, listen, we, Luke has written about this many times before. Oh, right. <laughs> you cannot win the Stanley Cup in October, no. but you can lose it. Yeah. You can lose it by by a really slow start and putting yourself in a deep hole and being in a, you know, the 06 team, one of the great things they did was they came out guns blazing and mm -hmm. they had an attitude from the jump that this is who we're going to be. Mm-hmm. We've seen that with Rod's teams. You know, Rod, Peter Laviolette, the, the former coach, won the cup with the Canes. Very similar mindsets, right? You don't want to get yourself into scramble mode. And, and that's not where the Canes are now under Rod Brendamore. They're not in scramble mode. There no, is not. a little bit of luxury there. 
you mentioned the defensive pairings and trying to figure it out. That's what this is about. That's what you can do. You remember, they didn't need to add Dmitry Orlov. Mm-mm. That was not a need. It was a luxury. That pick. was a luxury, and that was a that was Tom Dunn being like, "Oh, you 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 think I like lost money on the AAIF, and I'm over here like trying to scratch two pennies together?" No, he's like, good for it. No, 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 guys. Like he's good we're, for we're trying to make moves here, and to your- and I get that that Pesci situation is still out there. Mm-hmm. I think they're totally comfortable with that, and I think they understand where Pesci. They always have a number. And they gave the number to Orloff because that that was the number they had for him, and he took it. But there's an adjustment there, mm-hmm. right? Like we're not just seeing him play with Slavin as we've seen in the past with Tony D'Angelo in a different situation. Nice luxury to have to have extra pieces and to try to figure out what are the best combinations. You know, you and I we've talked often about Tavo Teravine, and, mm-hmm. and, and if we can go back to Tom Dundon's comments to us, the first person that he brings up in our conversation about turbo. this team was Tavo Teravon. And, mm-hmm. we, and we've talked before about how he is a bit of a loss leader at times mm-hmm. because of what he means to Sebastian Ajo. So the only way to figure out how these guys work together is to try them in different combinations. And you know Rod is going to do that. He's, hopefully he'll tinker with that. And obviously with the with the Freddie Anderson situation, again, as of this recording, we don't know what the situation is. Hopefully we'll get some for, more information as to what happened. But they have... Peter Kochekov as well. And they do. As we mentioned at the beginning of the season, uh, when we were talking to Tom Dundon, <laughs> they, both, they both would have said it. Tom and Rod both were like, not trying to jinx themselves. But, but like, hey, yeah, guys, we have three of them. We expect they're going to be. play. Yeah. And there's going to be some issues. And again, last year, it worked out to about each one of them played about a third of the season. So the Canes, the Canes will hopefully figure it out. And I'm not going to be too worried about it. Although what the Canes can do is they can start listening to Creed, Joe. Creed, you yeah. say? Creed. Arms wide open, mm-hmm. or what do you Can got? you take me higher? Oh, but I wanted a wow, right? Sports has somehow brought a creed renaissance to my front door, Joe, and I don't know what to do with this. Sports or sports, sports. Okay, so this started with the Texas Rangers. Okay, okay, which, oh, by the way, speaking of baseball, the Phillies doing the thing that drives people nuts with the postseason versus the regular season, sure. And tying it back to the Canes, you can have a hell of a great regular regular season, but if something gets hot, well, then right. good night for you, right? Tying it back to the Phillies lost in the World Series last year. This yes. wasn't a team that was, you know, coming out of nowhere. They got the Nationals in 19 sure, and they sure, won. Like, sure. Oh, we got hot on in June and we just kept it going. Sure. This was a team that experienced, you know, a, a hot streak last year and now added Trey Turner. Oh, look at that. Another home run for Trey Turner. Like, do I have to start a beef with the other Joe Giglio? <laughs> you do. Just to confuse everyone? Let's like, just go. Let's what's that? I, I put My that God, in the universe. Get I put, it done, man. I put that in the universe yesterday, so uh, I'm all about it. No, so apparently the Rangers, when they were going through it, they started listening to Creed as a joke, as like a pump up, and they credit the music of Creed for the turnaround and now it's become a habit you know how superstitious sports yes. guys can be man. you start winning what do we do we gotta start listening to more creed before every meal and we listen to creed that's what we're gonna do and even at the end of when they wrapped up uh when they wrapped up their last series uh matt hicks who's the play-by-play for the rangers even went in with the whole you know can you take me higher you know deep out in the left field hayes going back mitch garver can you take me higher all right so what did the Minnesota Vikings do this past weekend, Joe? No, did they turn to Scott Stapp? Is that his name? Scott Stapp. But, you know, they won, right? Okay. The Vikings won. So Kirk Cousins, after the game, was oh, asked about the turnaround. And here's what Kirk Cousins said. But it does feel really good to win, to win on the road in the division. And um, uh, Garrett Bradbury in the locker room pregame uh, took a clip from the, from the Texas Rangers and made sure that Creed got played before he went out on the field. And I felt like that. That may have made the difference. So we got that going for us. But uh, take any questions, yeah. Wolfpack in the house. <laughs> That's right. So I don't this is a byproduct of of getting older and watching the ebbs and flows of things that are ridiculed, then enjoyed ironically, and then people end up just admitting they like it. Right? Okay, And Creed is in that boat. I credit that Thanksgiving Day Creed halftime performance for a the Dallas Cowboys, Cowboys game. Because that was that's been a meme for the longest time. Right. Like you, you pop on social media anytime. You'll see that. every it's, 
you know, there was a TikTok trend about do men think about the Roman Empire? Like, how often do you think about the Roman right, Empire, right? right? right. Well, for me, it's how often do you think about that Creed clip? At least once a day. I'll admit, at least once a day, I'll think about that ridiculous performance from a Dallas Cowboys Thanksgiving Day game. So it was enjoyed ironically for a bit. But I, you get to a point where you're, you get older and you're far enough removed and listening to that music puts you back in a place when you were younger and then you suddenly start to enjoy it for what it is. Well, also, so this album, the Creed album came out in 99 and yeah. I was actually thinking, I actually had this exact thought the other day. Yeah. That if you think about it right now, the tw 23s, mm -hmm. like, you know, 23, 24, my kid, my, James, class of 23, yeah. Jackson, class of 26, like 20 years previous to them is the 2000s, mm -hmm. which would be this Creed, right. Backstreet Boys, this right. other stuff. When we were in high school in the 90s. This was trash. No, no, no. We were in high school in the 90s. Mm -hmm. 20 years before that was either the late 60s. Mm -hmm. So you're like, yeah, man, Led Zeppelin, The, the Doors, man. Yeah, yeah, The Doors. Because that movie so came out. Right. And it was like, oh, man. <laughs> and you thought you were like hot, the hot shit. Right. Right. But right. think about it. Like, like, have you ever listened to Dark Side of the Moon <laughs> while watching <laughs> Wizard of Oz? Dude. So you thought stuff from late 60s. Right. Uh, the 70s. Right. Was like you were cool, man. Right. Think but about Creed that now. Was like, never cool. Whoa, 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 whoa. But Creed was never cool. Cool. Creed was Led pop Zeppelin was cool. Creed was popular. There's a difference, though. There's a difference between popular and cool. Creed was never cool. Creed was popular. It's like the nickelback. But Creed wasn't cool to you in your adult mindset in the 2000s. If you were a kid seeing them on either because okay. now i'll give you another one here either you saw them on the cowboys halftime yeah or there were a bunch at that time wwf when they would do like their inspiring videos yeah yeah it yeah. was they, they had creed songs yeah. with like stone cold like bleeding right like you thought if yeah. you were a kid like when i say a kid, prison. Yeah, if you were a kid like growing up in your teens yeah you're right you probably or maybe, not in your teens because you would have been too much peer pressure to say like oh creed sucks nickelback sucks of course but if you were like 10 11 12 yeah okay you would thought oh my god did you see that stone cold video <laughs> <laughs> and then they were on with the halftime and uh, terrell owens popped out of the big red bucket that was so cool man the creedissance the creed i'll admit the creedissance is messing with me it's messing with me. Yeah. Because I, I I understand. Well, sometimes we overthink the music stuff too. Like we're not too far removed where there was this like reassessment of Limp Bizkit. We just had that. Yeah. Under the same premise. Under the same premise yeah. where it gets far enough removed that you go through the cycle of it was popular. There's the backlash. Then it's enjoyed ironically. And then you just admit this is good stuff. And sometimes we overthink it. Sometimes you just need dumb rock music to get you. And that's where I am now as an adult. At 44, I've just come to the conclusion, sometimes I just need dumb rock to blank my brain out and just go. And I think that's where Creed probably checks that list for a lot of people. For me, it's like going back and listening to Corn or Limp Bizkit, that sure. like rap metal era stuff. Yeah. If I just need to turn my brain off. Let the bodies hit the floor, whoever right, that was. I'll listen to freaking, you know, Dragula from White Zombie and all that stuff. Creed doesn't do that for me necessarily, but I can see where if you have the itch for dumb rock to turn your brain off and just like lose it, man, like let's just go. I can see where that does scratch it for a particular age range. I can see that. I can see that. Anyway, we got on a Creed tangent. I'll try not to sing anymore. I, I promise you. I hit the wrong button. That's not housekeeping. Housekeeping proper buttons shall we we'll hit the proper housekeeping buttons uh, a little bit of housekeeping we've got new podcast new young gun with dimitri Romanos and lauren brownlow that's out that's out every tuesday and thursday we'll also have a new 919 vice with our friends over at breeze through or over at butcher's, butcher's market. market you got a new law of the wolf law of the wolf we got picks we got pizza you name it got all that fun stuff we got it all and our friends over at wunc have a new podcast as well north carolina's public radio it's called The Broadside. It's hosted by award-winning podcast producer Anissa Khalifa. The Broadside explores news, history, pop culture stories rooted in the American South. And each week, the show goes beyond the headlines to explore a single topic impacting the region 
And along the way, they zoom out and explain how it reverberates across the country. So go ahead, follow and listen to new episodes of The Broadside every Thursday, wherever you get your podcast. Before you move on, we have two other housekeeping notes. Yes. 11-2, we're going to be giving away football tickets to the Duke-Carolina game. Okay. The biggest football game of the season. Duke Carolina in Chapel Hill. Thanks to our friends at UNC football mm-hmm. reminder. If you can't get your primary seats, go to seat geek, mm-hmm. right? Get yourself over to Keenan stadium. It's an unbelievable schedule this year, but we are running out of home dates. There are big shouts to Will Budden. Remember he won the tickets at the golf tournament to the Campbell game. So we still have these tickets to the Duke game to give away. So we're doing that on 11 2 that's a Thursday. We're going to be with Matt Davis over at State Farm. We're going to have a football toss. It's going to be ridiculous. It is going to be ridiculous. It's going to be enjoyable. But you want to do eight contestants? Yeah. Okay. I think we do a bracket style. All right. So you can leave a comment right there on the YouTubes if you'd like to enter. Because mm-hmm. remember, we have like this whole platform. Sometimes I think, well, Joe, would you put out something on the Instagrams or some other nonsense? Mm-hmm. No, no, no. Just leave a comment right there. That's fine. We'll get you 11 2 in Garner. Giving away those tickets to Duke and Carolina, but you got to earn them. Okay. Totally on board. Now, 11 7, 11 7 is a Tuesday. That is the official OG tailgate. Kane's game. This is important. We will have wings for you. We will have a ride to and from the game from you. We will have beverages for you, Mm -hmm. but we don't have tickets for you. (laughs) Okay. So the tickets are on you. (laughs) Yeah. you, You need to just come out and say hi. But this is a our wings are better than yours game. Mm-hmm. This is 11 7. It's a Tuesday night over at PNC Arena, the OG tailgate with our friends at Wings Over and Sleek Feet Fleet. Okay. How do you want to take contestants for that one? We got four. We got four winners to give away for that one. Uh, we'll, we'll talk to Jordan about getting an Instagram post for All that. All right. We'll put that on your radar. Okay. Our wings I'll, are better than your wings. I'll, I'll write that down. The official OG tailgate 11 7 again from our friends at Wings Over. And Sleek Fleet. I wrote it down. 11-7. IG per- contest. Perfect. We'll make that happen. Big thanks to my hometown realty. MyHTR.com uh, makes things really, really easy to understand. Buy, sell. They got a little tab for you on the website. Mortgage calculator. But more importantly, it's about maximizing the value of your home. This is not about walking away with some you know, guaranteed offer or whatever. No, you understand what this market is right now. So maximize it when you're selling your home and Hometown Realty can make that happen for you. It's also about their broker family at Hometown Realty. Do you know how do you get to 250 agents? Do you know, like you, you have to want to work for that company. Mm-hmm. It's not just locations. It's not just volume. That's a family. You have to want to work together. All right, could you say it's my family? My, not my family, but Barry's family. Broker family. That's what it's about. You want to rely on their expertise. Not mine. No. Not my nonsense. Not some random guy on a highway either. You want to rely on someone who's here, who's local from Raleigh to the coast. It's myhtr.com. Also, big thanks to Whitaker and Hamer. Check them out online at wh.lawyer. Again, that's wh.lawyer, attorneys and counselors at law. Uh, They'll even knock things out for community (laughs) service like they have for Joe Giglio. Josh is going to be very proud of me. Oh. Uh, I have made my arrangements for my community service Good hours for, for my traffic violation. Good for you. October 31st, <laughs> I will be over at Khan Elementary School <laughs> for their Entrepreneur Day. I love it. Joining us on the Heaster Automotive Group Hotline, Julian Council, Locked on Panthers podcast. Julian, what's going on, man? Not much, man. Doing all right. 0-6, bye week, feeling good. Oh, yeah. This this is prime content <laughs> season for Panthers land, isn't it? Which oh, is yeah. which is why I'm actually gonna read you just you just you just hit me with a text at 249 yesterday afternoon. And yeah, I appreciate yeah. you listening to the podcast. Um <laughs> <laughs> so you start your text. I mean, this is a this is a lot, by the way. I'm just gonna show this right here. This is a lot. <laughs> Can you explain to me what state fans are upset about with their football program? Seriously, I don't understand how a program that has one 10 win season and doesn't recruit at a high level has a fan base that is this upset. And we tried to explain this yesterday, Julian, when we we entered the Herb Sendek zone. All uh, right. In yeah. that 
when it has a lot to do with the neighbors. And it's yet another reminder that the triangle is one of the most unique sports landscapes in all of the country, because you can have all the things that you just laid out for state. But when they see Duke doing what they're doing and Carolina's got this once in a generation quarterback talent with a but, but maybe a window to the college football playoff. Yeah, man, they're going to be pissed off. I don't see this. is Not that hard to understand, Julian. OK, well. I understand like basketball because I recall they won a banner uh, back in 74 and 83. So there's at least history there. They were the rival with Carolina before K came. Mm -hmm. I understand my history with Norm Sloan, Everett Case and all that. And NC State really taking to the basketball court and dominating early in the 50s and the ACC. Uh, They never did that in football. So I'm just I'm just kind of confused. And like I understand last year was considered the window. I'm looking back at the 2017 team and I'm seeing 18 NFL players, according to college football reference. And they lost to Clemson with Kelly Bryant as a starting quarterback at home by seven points. Like if they win that game, they go to the ACC championship. Like that was Dave Dorn's most talented team. We're going to look back at last year's team and there's going to be Drake Thomas, who's with Seattle. Zavala, who's with the Panthers, hasn't looked very good. Mm -hmm. And in the rest of them, it's not like there's going to be a ton of NFL players like they were be- they were able to benefit off of a bunch of 24-year-old dudes out there and still couldn't get it done because they weren't that talented. So I'm just, if anything, I think fans should be upset about 2017, not last year, because college football is a talent acquisition game. Yeah. Also, defensive lines are what helps you win. They have Bradley Chubb, B.J. Hill, Justin Jones, Darian Roseboro, Contavia Street. Do they have any of those type of guys like last season? Like Savion Jackson's never lived up to recruiting hype. So neither did a lot of those guys from that class. I'm just kind of confused, honestly, how one one season, one 10 one season. And it's like, oh, my God, everything's falling apart when Dave has done a great job. They're consistently an eight, nine win program. I know the folks in Chapel Hill would take that because it's we always hear about no. the sleeping giant. But that's not no. that's not happening. Stop it. Eight, nine no. wins. That's that's who you are. That's what most college no, programs had, should expi- aspire to be. Me. You had me nodding along until you said, oh, Carolina fans would take that. They absolutely would not. They should. And they got the same level of history as NC State when it comes to football. It's a historically 500 program. They all are. That's the thing. We they qualified that Julian is a Carolina fan, right? Yeah, we, yeah. Yeah. go ahead. Qualify. But I, me as a Carolina fan yeah. is saying, no, I would, saying, what Dave Doran's done at NC State, I would take that consistency. Like, yes, this year. Carolina, who, wow, they had three straight top 15 classes, got a, a five-star recruit quarterback, had a bunch of blue chips in the defensive line that grew up. Wow, all of a sudden, it's like the talent finally showed up. Maybe start doing that. Maybe start doing that. <laughs> recruit at a higher level. When you recruit at a higher level, then I can understand fan frustration. But when he's been able to do this with consistent classes that are like in – the middle of the ACC, which is really like in the 30s or 40s, according to like 24-7 sports, I don't understand how people can be upset. But if you're recruiting at a top 15 level on a year-in and year-out basis, and these are the results, yeah. and you have a down season like this, then I understand being pissed off. But like right now, I just don't get it. they have been like the model of consistency in the league, especially for like what NC State as a program has been historically, and this is how people feel. I I, I don't understand, personally. <laughs> no, I point out that you're a Carolina fan because it's good. Like it's good to hear and have different viewpoints from different people. Yeah, That's and good. I and I hope this is not coming like across as like I'm talking about state fans. I'm just trying to understand like how why are y'all like why are y'all like this? Like literally, just appreciate what you have. Seventeen is literally the I, I have said many times. Don't be mad about this season. Be mad about seventeen. That, that, that's, that's the year. Be mad about. Yes. Um. I. I, I literally. <laughs> <laughs> so how old are you? I'm thirty. It's interesting that you brought up basketball because Joe's age, my age, what what happened was state in the 90s was so bad at basketball and and so beaten down that they tried with Chuck mm-hmm. to get into this era of fine. You mentioned Shashevsky. It was like fine. Duke and Carolina are now this in basketball and we're way over here, right? But in right. football, that's in football, our, once chance. once Mac was gone, beating their brains in, and then the backup safety was beating them down in Charlotte, and Michael Kane could never beat Mac. It became until until Mac went to Texas. Mm-hmm. It became well, wait, State can be the best in football, so that mm-hmm. it became like this identity, particularly for a certain demographic of the, of the fan base, the i.e., ones. the thirties and the forties, because yeah. yeah. they don't remember eighty three, right? Like a lot of people in our group 
don't remember 83. I was four. So it's not necessarily about, to your point, well, it, yes, it could always be worse. And you, you can go three and nine, you can go two and 10, you could do what Elfed did. Um, but I would absolutely say to you that Elfed still won his division and had an 11 win season, right? And, and Carolina was in a big hurry to get rid of him. Oh, yeah. So it's not like state fans don't appreciate something. It's everybody doesn't appreciate something. Well, we, we always kind of want what we don't have, but right? You, you just nailed like you're saying consistency. And, and I'm saying to you, what state fans want is to have that one Larry Fed year. But you just nailed the <laughs> issue. You just nailed the issue. And we'll we'll close the state portion of this conversation uh, before we get to the Panthers. That transitionary period in the late 90s that brought on Chuck Amato and Marianne Fox at Texas the stadium who cared about expansion, and expansion and, yeah. all that stuff is like, this is where we get over on the other schools. Yes. You can have basketball. Football yeah. is the future. We've seen it. <laughs> We've seen it. You can have it. And what's happened is North Carolina, both North Carolina and Duke, since that transition, have both done things that state can't, and state's the one that has actually given a shit. That's yeah. the problem. State yeah. like truly really gives a shit about trying to be good in football and they can't get over themselves at Carolina. And you know this, Julian, you know this. It is a luxury. That is a luxury good at UNC football, being good at football. It's oh, yeah. Item. And with Duke, it's kind of like, hey, fun story. But unless it's Clemson or Notre Dame, they ain't bringing bodies to Wallace Wade, man. So to see, a, and you know, state fans, this rankles state fans all the time. It's up. Mike Elko's not even going to be there in two years or even after this year. It's just like it's maddening for state fans. And that's why you're seeing this reaction, man. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because like history in a way repeats itself because wasn't it like Duke in Carolina that were great at football like in the 50s and states like, all right, let's go be good at basketball. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So and they yes. decided now in yeah, the 90s it. like, oh, let's go be yes. good at football. Yeah, right. I, I'm just it's disappointed me that like NC State basketball is not like what it like should uh, be, in my opinion. Like that's, I, right. that's the thing that really like I look at at that athletic department and just wonder like, why can't you get that right? We can have that conversation in January when yes. the Panthers are, you know, 0 and 17. And, and we're scouting second round picks. Your your favorite yeah, pastime. Yeah, that is your favorite. Oh. All right. So talent acquisition. Oh, this, is a, this, is a, this is a perfect transition. This is why I wanted to talk to you today. <laughs> Julian Council will be Locked On Panthers podcast. Shout out to our friends over at Locked On ACC, by the way. Shout out to Candace and, and the crew. But they need talent. <laughs> the Panthers clearly need talent. And I'm not interested in relitigating things that Scott Fitterer had to say back in the spring, in the summer of what kind of group they thought. Because again, they thought they had a wide receiver group that they can plug a quarterback into. They had a defense that, again, one quarterback away from being competitive. It turns out it's the opposite. I'm not going to sell on Bryce Young just yet because I think it's fairly obvious after the 0-6 start the wide receiver group outside Adam Thielen has not been that good. The offensive line has regressed. Their defense is so hurt they can't stay on the freaking field that this is not a complete group that you can truly judge Bryce Young on. So you go out and you get better. But here we we end up with the monkey's paw. In order to get Bryce Young, you gave up a lot. And now you don't really have assets to get better. They have catch space, but they don't have draft picks. How do they do this, Julian? <sighs> And right. that's your answer. I was going to say, there's your answer. Done. Clip it. Sigh. Done. Big sigh. How do they do this? Big Julian Council sigh. It's interesting because a lot of people want them to go trade good players for draft picks. Yeah. And we have seen they traded Christian McCaffrey. They used one of the picks, the second round pick last year to move up to get Bryce. They used the third and fourth round picks they got from San Francisco to draft DJ Johnson, a 25-year-old project edge rusher out of Oregon, who's only played last week in their loss against the Dolphins. So you see, you give him a good player, and what do you do with the draft picks? With DJ Moore, of course, they traded him to be able to get Bryce, not really for picks, but it depends on like what they do with those picks. Like I, I understand, okay, hey, the best way to build your team is through the draft, but you have to nail the draft. And you look back at some of the classes that he's had so far, it's not like Scott Bitter has done that. And when you're saying, hey, let's get rid of some of the first round guys that you got that you have, that's the only time they're hitting. Like they they hit on Brian Burns, they hit on Christian McCaffrey. Of course, previous regimes, uh, they JC Horn, if he's ever healthy, I think they could hit on that. 
it's just it's the day two and day three picks that are killing this team so far. And you look at this past year's draft, like Jonathan Mingo, I haven't been impressed by him at all so far, the second round pick at Ole Miss. But it's not like he has to be great right now. But considering the position they put him in, they kind of needed him to be a factor. And right now, he's not really a factor. Terrace Marshall, a couple years ago, second round pick, has yet to be a factor. Frank Reich forgot to play him. And the week five loss on the road against Detroit. Like, I don't know how that even happens. That's like the real issue for me. Okay, the best way to improve your team is by drafting better players. The problem is, even when they have draft picks, I think they have like six or seven this year, they keep missing out on that. They had an 11-man draft back in 21, or two, yeah, 21, and the only guys that are really contributors off of that team are – J.C. Horn, who's never healthy, Tommy Trimble, who's like your third string tight end, Terrace Marshall, who's your fourth or fifth wide receiver, and Shuba Hubbard, who right now is your best running back. The rest of those guys aren't on the team. Like, you can't have that many bites of the apple and get one and a half impact players. Yeah. I'm laughing at the... Let me ask a real question. Do you think Scott Fritterer under Matt Rule was actually making the draft picks, or do you think... That was a big Matt Rule energy draft room. David Tepper came out and said he would never have an arrangement with a head coach like you have Matt Rule. That basically told anybody that okay. was listening, that was willing to listen, that a lot of that was Matt Rule. Like, mm -hmm. did, do I think Scott Fitter decided that, hey, man, let's go draft a long snapper? Like, you heard the conversation. You think, <laughs> like, the Kalen Barnes kid out of Baylor, who's a seventh round pick, didn't make the team, ended up, I think, in Miami. Like, that was a Matt Rule decision. And you even look at this past year's draft, DJ Johnson, Ajero Averro is the one who really wanted him to defense a coordinator in Carolina. It's not, it's not all on Scott Fitter. And with David Tepper as active of a participant as he is as an owner in the open circuit out there that Stephen Holder of ESPN.com covers the Colts and even Rich Eisner saying that he's the one who really wanted Bryce Young, how can I blame the general manager when the owner is that involved and yeah. clearly is influencing decisions? So I, I think Matt Rule had the majority of the control, especially in 21. I think Scott was the one who was making all the trades and wheeling and dealing because Matt doesn't know how to do that. But as far as like the actual player selections, in 2021, I definitely think that was Matt Rule. That was an 11-man class. In 22, I maybe it's a little bit of Scott Fitter, but I don't know. I think it was mainly Rule. Julian Council locked on. Panthers podcast joining us here on Ovis and Julio on the Heaster Automotive Group Hotline. All right, we'll get out of here on this because right, the big news of the week is that Frank Reich gave up play calling. I think he's doing it stubbornly. I don't believe him that they were going to make this decision at some point in time. We were going to do it all along. We, we were going to do this all along. We no, you weren't. No, we wouldn't. No, no, you wouldn't have. You, you, know, know. You, you would not have done that. Um, <laughs> so now I feel like there has to be a realistic view of what Thomas Brown as the offensive coordinator can do um, with Bryce Young. Because I think Joe and I are in agreement on this. And I'm, I'm sure you, you kind of on the same level too. The season sunk, all right? I don't, I don't want to hear Frank Reich talking about, well, anything can happen. We have 11 more games. No, no, no. The season is sunk. So now your number one goal is to not break Bryce Young. If he is your guy, you cannot break him. And I do think this move did need to happen. Results aside, I'm more curious about how they kind of change up what they can do with the offense and not be so vanilla. Bryce Young, I'm not, I'm not going to go, I don't want to go like full let him cook. But clearly, he can do a heck of a lot more than what Frank Reich has allowed him to do. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see what it looks like. I still feel like they have some of the same issues uh, with Reich that they're going to have with Thomas Brown. Like the offense line, in theory, can get better once Austin Corbett comes back. I do caution yeah. people to understand the man tore his ACL back in January. He has been rehabbing this entire time. He's only been practicing the last couple of weeks. He has to come off pup next Wednesday or he's out for the rest of the season. So I expect that he'll be activated uh, next Wednesday. I just don't know how much that's going to really do. Uh, Cade May seems to be fine there at left guard. I, I think you got to kind of give Zavala some time because he was a liability when he was actually healthy and God, God bless it that that did not seem look like it looked um, when he got carted off a couple weeks ago. But the O-line, I still think they're going to have some issues. because Icky, he's regressed. He's got to start playing better. Uh, so mm -hmm. I don't think the offensive line is going to all of a sudden get better. The receivers are what they are. They're not going to be trading for a receiver. Adam Thielen's the only guy that Bryce clearly trusts. But is there a way to maybe utilize the tight ends more? Thomas Brown was working with the tight ends last year in Los Angeles. Of course, he worked with Sean McVay, and they've always you know used tight ends, whether it's been um, – Tyler Higby or Gerald Everett when he was with the, the Rams. So let's find a way to get Hayden Hurst. So they paid a ton. They paid him about the same amount of money. They paid Miles Sanders and Adam Thielen, and he's barely getting targeted in the game. Find a way to hit, get him involved. 
Thomas Brown, former running back. Maybe they actually would establish an identity of trying to run the football. When they were leading that game on Sunday, it was because they were running the ball. Then they got away from that, and they tried to be a pass-happy team. But you can't blow. Yeah, they tried, they tried so, to run with the Dolphins, which I thought was hysterical. Yeah, like, you, you, you can't, you can't do, that. do that. You cannot you can't do that block. with the No, you can't keep up with them. And you also, you, you can't block enough to be able to hold up for a same period of time in a game. I just, I'm curious to see how it works. Like, I think it's the best decision. And I agree that like, if there are six and oh, this is not happening. He can say whatever he wants. David Tepper, after his first year of the ownership here in Carolina, had Ron Rivera become the play caller on defense and also run a three, four scheme. So that tells you there's already a history oh. of him interfering and having the weekly Tuesday meetings, mm -hmm. you're telling me that this didn't come up on a weekly basis. If fans yeah. on Twitter are saying, hey, we need a different play caller. If Josh Norris, who's a very, who's obviously very smart, covers this. If he's yeah. saying, hey, give Thomas Brown a chance. You don't think the owner is saying the exact same thing? So Frank can say whatever he wants. David Tepper wanted this to, to be the case. But it, there's going to be a learning curve uh, for Thomas Brown. I think it makes sense to do it now. He's just, learning. I Bryce is learning. So why not move with the future? But the offense is not going to get any better. Yeah. I just had that lightning bolt when you said that about the three, four, because yeah. it's something we haven't talked about that the given was going to be that the defense. Yeah. Remember it's actually was pretty good. It was pretty good. Even under rule. It was, it was pretty good, but mm -hmm. then they switched the alignment and I've always kind of thought, well, why did they switch the alignment? Pittsburgh. Are you telling me that they switched the alignment because the owner used to be involved with the Pittsburgh Steelers and thinks that you're supposed to play a three, four, regardless yes. of what your that's personnel exactly is. It. Yes. Exactly yes. It. I, I'm telling you, that's what happened. Cause they, and they tried in 19, they had, they were bringing back cam. They got Gerald McCoy. Then when I got Bruce Irvin, they tried to build a defensive line for a three, four scheme. And they had an awful running defense. What do they have this year? An awful rushing oh defense. My God. It's absolutely. Cause he was from Pittsburgh. One of three, four. That's real football and defense. That's why they run it. I'm telling you, that's why they run it. Are they going to get like the corpse of Dick LeBeau to come out there and coach the team? Oh, maybe, man. Maybe Cower? <laughs> get him out of the booth? Do you think we'll close on this? It's it's bad. You you <laughs> mentioned you mentioned Josh Norris. Do you think David Tepper in a weekly meeting with Frank Reich goes, "All right, Frank, explain this." So yeah, here's here's well, explain this to me. And he's showing a gif from Josh's Twitter account. You think that's what's happening right now? He's like, just Josh, said, you just just what you can't play with these cards. Frank, tell me what's going on here. You think he's doing I, that? I I imagine he's on Twitter and he sees all that stuff and he brings it up. Does he actually show the phone image? I don't know. I hope I doubt does. it, but I but no, I, 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 I know. I know he's listening. I know he's out there watching and listening to everything, and he's out there asking Frank Reich the same questions that. Panthers fan 8069 is asking on Twitter. I love it. Absolutely love it. You think uh, you think Tepper's got a burner text line to Kyle Bailey? You think that's what's happening? Oh, God. I told Kyle a long time ago that he needed to stop looking at those texts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't we all, man? Don't we all? All right, Julian Council, Lots on Panthers podcast. Go check it out. Good stuff. Every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. My man's got to talk Whoa. about the Panthers and he does it. All right, man. We'll talk to you later. <laughs> okay. Poor Julian, man. Five days a week. Five days a week, dude. And he does the instant reactions. That's a well. job, dude. It is. That's that's work. It is. So that's why uh, to kind of give... I mean, we're going to talk about the Panthers with Julian, but just kind of give him a, a breather. I wanted to let him get his state takes off. I like it. And again, it's good to get a different perspective on these things as well. So again, we appreciate Julian for hanging out. We appreciate Matt Davis over at State Farm. Check him out online, insuregarner.com. Give him a call directly at 919-779-8277. Or you can go to the OG Insurance. Dot com and they got a cool charity event taking place Saturday. Yes, the Ring of Fire, a little meat cook off, a little chili cook off. We got our friends from Trophy involved. Nice. We got some kegs over there. We got our friends from the Butcher's Market involved. We got some gift cards for the winners. And of course, it all goes to the uh, community of hope in Garner. So it's such a great, great deal for Matt. Check them out, the OGinsurance.com. Also, big thanks to Homefield for sponsoring Obias and Gilio. Check them out, homefieldapparel.com. Use that promo code OG23. Again, that's OG23. Get 15% off your first order. They've got stuff coming out all the time. Like every week they're dropping new hotness. Like I, 
I, sometimes I want to tell home field, pace yourself. Yeah, guys. Slow pace down. yourself. You got so much good stuff, and I only, only have so much in the budget. But in order to save some money, you can use that promo code OG23 off your first order. Next topic, please. I feel like we're we're definitely getting your dad something. What could we get your mom that she would enjoy, Miami wise, from home field? That's a good question. I don't know. Perfect, my mom, my mom's storm from two thousand one. No, my, my mom is over it when it comes to the hurricanes. I'll have to go find something. I'll go look at the page. I'll go look at the page. They they do have some, team of the eighties. Maybe that's what it is. I like that. One. Maybe that's what it is. Next topic, please. Every time we do talk about the Panthers, it's brought to you by Graffiti. Go check them out in downtown Cary. They got great bourbon specials. Tuesday, that was yesterday. Those are the break-even nights. You missed it. No big deal because they got more specials on Sunday. Maybe you can have a reprieve from the Carolina Panthers. Watch other football and enjoy great bourbon specials over at Graffiti. Speaking of the uh, of the NFL, I saw something from Micah Parsons this morning that further adds to your topic, your favorite topic of 2023, <laughs> Joe, which is... Media is dead. Media is dead. So, so Micah Parsons got his podcast. And I know, shocker, right? And Parsons decided to go on an understandable rant about how the Dallas Cowboys are discussed after a loss versus how other teams in the NFL are discussed after a loss. I just don't condone the bashing of Dak Prescott and the Dallas Cowboys and have the same energy for the Eagles. We want the same energy for everybody because there's a whole bunch of bashing when it's Dak Prescott, but not the same when it's the Eagles. I got time today. A lot of people said the Browns defense was overhyped. I said the Browns are the real deal. Acho said this, which pissed me off. I'm not worried about the 49ers. They were missing Christian McCaffrey, Debo Samuel. The Browns were missing Deshaun Watson, Nick Chubb. They were missing them key factors before the game even started. So why is it that we are just scrubs and we're nobodies that don't deserve to be on the field and we're just all talk? But there's a hundred excuses for these other these other teams. If y'all just want to hate Cowboys Nation, just say y'all hate Cowboys Nation. I'm tired of people trashing my quarterback. I'm tired of people trashing my team. And that's why I had nothing to say to the media this week. You want to hear me talk? Come to hear me talk on The Edge Monday night. And that's point blank period. There it is, Joe. Right there at the end. I, I thought that would warm your heart. You want to hear me talk? Listen Here's to my, my own thing, man. Here's my own thing. It does crack me up how much of what is left of the, uh, the talk complex is reacting to what somebody said because so much time for these players is spent in a hotel room mm -hmm. and they have nothing else to do. Yeah, so they, they turn the ESPN on, they watch it, and then they react to it. So, I it's mean, great. it's like a natural cycle, right? I think it's great. But why, it's like him getting fired up about the Browns. It's kind of cracking me up. But hey, like I like I told you, you don't need any of this other stuff. You want you want to hear what I want to say? I'm gonna come out and say it. You don't want it to be filtered through the team. You don't want it to be filtered. Like, you know what else is easier to do? Mm -hmm. It's easier to sit here, close the door, put your fancy graphics on, and it's easier to sit here and talk than it is to talk. In front of somebody. Yeah, that's. I mean, I know, that's and a, I'm that's not a, saying that's a generational that, like, thing. I'm not saying that like in a oh yeah, say yeah, it yeah, to yeah, my yeah. face, Michael Parsons. No, 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 no. I'm saying it in a way like they're more comfortable. His looks like a Twitch stream, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's basically what it that's, is. It, that's, look, he's a look, youth man. How many meetings? He's a youth. <laughs> how many meetings? How many meetings were we in where I argued about presentation and how younger consumers today do not care about right. flashy, super expensive cameras? because they're used to watching guys play games on a Twitch stream or present and interact with you on a Twitch stream, which is or, nothing or, more than or a, they were in class on a, on a, on a zoom computer. So they're very used to not the best. As long as the audio is money. Yep. How you look matters less and less and less in terms of presentation. Cause to your point, all this stuff has become mobile, but you know, it's interesting to Micah Parsons point. There's a couple things going on here. One, you're the Dallas Cowboys. You are right. America's team. You move the needle with all the discussion. Dak Prescott is also a classic, classic sports talk radio bait, national talk bait, uh, whether it's on a TV show or a national radio show. Is he elite? Is he not? I mean, Micah, my dude, we all understand that every conversation in the NFL revolves around the quarterback. And every win and loss is a referendum on whether that quarterback is good or not. Brock Purdy 
elevates to MVP status with all those guys around him. We're not sitting here talking about Christian McCaffrey as an MVP candidate. We're talking about whether or not Brock Purdy is elite. That's where the conversation goes. When you add the layer of the Cowboys and how they move the needle for everything, yeah, that's you, why. You want to be that. You, you don't want to be the Eagles. You don't want to be another team. But here's something that the Eagles and the Niners have done that the Dallas Cowboys haven't done. Where were the Eagles last year with Jalen Hurts? In the Super Bowl. Oh. And, and what have the 49ers consistently done with mm, Shanahan? They've won, made deep playoff runs. What have the Cowboys not done? Won in the playoffs or when it mattered. So that's why you're graded on that level. But again, that's another conversation for another day. To further your point, Joe, on athletes having a run on everything, I present to you Trevor May. Do you know who Trevor May is? I did not until earlier this week. So Trevor May goes on his Twitch stream. Literally. Literally his <laughs> Twitch, Twitch stream and then announces his retirement and then roasts the A's. For those of you that don't know, I was drafted. At 18 years old, I'm now 34 years old, 16 seasons, 10 major league seasons, and I am officially announcing my retirement from professional baseball. Now that it's official, to the A's organization and every single person part of it, I love all of you. Every single one of you, except for but. <laughs> one guy. We all know who that guy is. Sell the team, dude. I tried to get a sell shirt. It didn't get here fast enough. <laughs> sell it, man. Let someone who actually like takes pride in the things they own own something. There's actually people who give a shit about the game. Let them do it. Take mommy and daddy's money somewhere else, dork. <laughs> you think you're getting that in a locker room? No, man. <laughs> Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You think you're getting that with the team PR person standing over your shoulder? No, no, you're not. No, you're not. No, but to your to your point about how athletes would move the needle and we react to what they say, the gatekeeper was us. Sure. Right? You as a beat writer, you were the gatekeeper. Yeah. Uh, the person conducting the interview was the gatekeeper for this information. To your point about everybody having a podcast, everybody having a Twitch stream, and then everybody reacting to it, there's a deeper layer to how there's its own cottage industry now, where as people in our business realize that athletes are taking away all of what we used to do, that the only thing left for you to do is to beef with other personalities. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a deeper layer to that. But to further your point, Tom Brady has his own podcast, the Let's Go podcast. Tom Brady apparently would like it if they stopped playing flag football, which is ironic coming from Tom Brady, by the way. He created a penalty just for you. Yeah, dude, come on now. So they were talking about the Bills and the Giants over the weekend and whether or not there should have been a defensive holding call at the end of that game. There was no flag thrown. And these are the types of things that would benefit the offense, not as many flags for defensive holding. So Brady, in referencing this with the in, in the conversation, said it was definitely a penalty. There was obvious holding there. They just didn't call it. And then he continues, football is a physical sport. There's a physical element to all of this. You throw a 15-yard flag for something that, you know, 20 years ago maybe would not have been a flag, and that affects the game in a big way. Uh, CBS Sports put NFL stats out there for everybody to understand about whether or not there's more flags being thrown or not. Your intuition, if you feel like the games have been uglier because they've been throwing more flags, is correct. The NFL is actually on pace to throw more flags than they were throwing last year. 1,402 flags thrown through six weeks. And again, that is on track for 4,206 flags thrown. There were 3,726 flags thrown last year. That aside, Joe, I find it ironic that Tom Brady is talking about flag football, and that's where we're headed, when Tom Brady's career is benefited from the fact that we are playing flag football. But I guess Tom Brady is just like every other old dude. You leave and you start to go, it's not like how not it used to be. Same. It's not the same game I played, buddy. I, I think you'll see them tweak the penalties. Um, so I wouldn't worry about what they're on pace for. That's fair. Now this, I would be I would be worried about. Uh, from Andrew Siciliano. Teams averaged 18.4 points per game 
this past week in the NFL. That's a problem. 18.4. That is a problem. The lowest since week 15 in 2014. Mm-hmm. 18, less than three touchdowns per game was the league average this week. And you had the Dolphins out there skewing that number, by the way. Mm-hmm. I know you don't care about fantasy football. I don't. But fantasy football <laughs> is some kind of dogfight right now. Because unless you have a piece of the Dolphins, you're sitting here like, oh, look, I got four catches from for 55 yards. Like, that's a huge week right now in fantasy football. Yeah. One other note. I care about fantasy football. I know Joe. you do. I know the people you do. do. Oh, are we getting into our favorite topic? Which is? Text I sent you. About people who care about sports. Oh, we'll, the pew, we the can, pew yeah, research. We, we can get into that in a second because I have one, one, one other, more. one other example, and this is to further hammer home a point that I was making yesterday about our guy, Aaron Rodgers. Our guy, oh yes, our guy, Aaron your Rodgers. Guy. He's your guy. So, shout out to the New York Post that went and found four doctors, right? Because you know the whole thing is like, oh man, you're unbelievable, Robert Super Human, Robert Sala called him a freakazoid. He's, he's, he's absolutely going to play. It's amazing what is happening. And he keeps teasing. He keeps teasing that he's going to come back. So the New York Post went and got doctors and they said, yeah, um, you know, look, that's a cool procedure that, they're, that they've worked with for the repair and the rehab and everything else. But, you know, I would not recommend Aaron Rodgers getting back on the field this season because it could actually do further damage if you don't properly heal it. To tie it back to our conversation at the beginning of this podcast, the Carolina Hurricanes are being absolutely cautious with the likes of Andre Svechnikov. Yep. Because they don't need him right now. Okay. With Aaron Aaron Rodgers, it's not about whether the Jets need him. It's that Aaron Rodgers has the need to be needed. If you have not figured this out yet, you have not been paying attention. And what did I say yesterday, Joe? That clearly the relationship between Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift is bothering him. That dude is fucking salty about Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift. So sure enough, he did his Pat McAfee appearance yesterday. Shout out to the revenue share. And he was, the setup here is that he was talking about dressing up like Steven Seagal in Under Siege. And he was doing some sort of dance, right? He's doing, you know, he's all part of the rehab thing. He's off in this weird mental space. So he's wrapping up this conversation. He's like, yeah, you know, kind of out here looking like I'm dancing like Britney Spears. Quick context. Britney Spears has gone viral lately because she's done these dancing videos. At one point, I think she was dancing with knives, if I'm not mistaken. (laughs) So here's the final exchange between Aaron Rodgers and AJ Hawk, his buddy. And listen carefully. I was more in the like a a traditional Steven Seagal gi, um, but just kind of. Tried to channel some of the dance moves I saw from uh, from Britney. Yeah, she's crushing it. You know, uh-huh. anytime you see a Britney Spears video, it's always captioned and titled as if everything's going she's well. She's divorced. You should you should uh, shoot your shot. You know, there's a big thing having like high celebrity, you know, high profile relationship. Oh, oh yeah, and Travis did it on the New Heights pod. Yeah, remember you can do it here. You will. The floor is yours. Listen, I'm f- I'm really focused on my rehab right now. I don't think I can. Do this one. <laughs> okay. So, Come on. Okay. She, she might yeah. help. It's not a no. He loves ball. Yeah. He loves ball. The guy loves bo- loves rehab. Loves ball. Twenty four seven. Hmm. Another shot, huh? I'm telling you, dude. I'm freaking telling you. <laughs> Love it when I nail people. All right. So to your text. This is from uh, the Pew Research Center. Most Americans don't closely follow professional or college sports. Roughly 115 million people watched the Super Bowl in 2023, making it the most widely viewed U.S.-based telecast in history. Large numbers of Americans also watch or attended college sports. In August, for example, more than 92,000 people attended an outdoor women's volleyball match in Nebraska. Remember that? That was pretty cool. Breaking the attendance record for any women's sporting event in the United States. Yet for all the fanfare surrounding professional and college sports, most Americans do not closely follow or often talk about them, according to a new Pew Research Center study. About 6 in 10 Americans, 62%, say they follow professional or college sports not too or not at all closely. Another 21% say they follow sports somewhat closely, while just 16% follow them extremely or very closely, according to an August survey of nearly 12,000 U.S. adults. Uh, Once again, kind of hammering the point that casuals exist, exist, yet nobody actually wants to talk to casuals anymore. But anyway, your take on that, Joe. I just It's fascinating to think about people who just don't 
operate in a sports sphere. I, I know those people exist. It's just they don't exist in my life. Like I don't know people who are not I get I they're not in like the daily grind like we are. I, no, I get I that part I of it. I know people like that. But I I honestly I don't I don't know that many people who aren't like, hey, even like I just want to go to the game. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like a lot of people I know are like, hey, uh, I would love to go to a Canes game or I'd love to go to a state game or sure. not because they like love football or love hockey, but it's about the experience, right? We're guilty of this and that we yeah. live in a bubble and no, we think that what happens in the bubble our is, bubble is the only thing that happens. It happens. And this is again, to yeah, tie I it, fully, I fully understand that part to, of it. To, to tie it back to Taylor Swift, you know, this is where the NFL thing cracks me up from time to time. The NFL is the biggest sport in America. Yeah. All right. It's clearly the most popular. Everybody watches it. You see the numbers and things like that. But NFL people have a hard time processing just because you are the number one American sport doesn't mean that you're number one in the hearts and minds of most Americans. And while you do get large audience numbers, that doesn't necessarily mean that people truly care. Sometimes people watch the NFL because it's habit. Sometimes yeah. people watch the NFL because they treat it like a pop culture thing where, well, I got to be able to function in the office on a Monday to understand what's going on in the NFL, fantasy football, et cetera. But then they get reminded every so often, here comes Taylor Swift and numbers go up because of Taylor Swift. And people are thinking, well, how could they possibly go up? I thought we were like maximizing everything. You weren't because there's still a hell of a lot more people out there that don't give a damn about this stuff than do. Um, that my takeaway from this simply isn't, it's not a, Oh, wow. You mean the people aren't into what I'm into? I mean, man, I've known that for a long time. I've known that for a really, really long time. And I've known that from like the context of being into video games at an early age or when it comes to even what I do now and having conversations with people. You know what will really make that happen? Because you, you, you deal with it two times because you're married to somebody who's also in the business. Right. So they're operating in that world all the time. And your friend base, they're all gamblers, right? They all golf, all those types of things. I don't know. Maybe it's because I went to school with a bunch of engineers. Maybe it's because, you know, Kelly, yeah, cares, yeah. Kelly cares about sports, but you run into enough lawyer circles where people don't give a damn about this stuff, right? And you, you know how many times I've had had conversations? You know how many times? It seems I, kind of freeing. I'm not going to lie to you. It is freeing, actually, because <laughs> you know how many times I had conversations where people would ask me, so what do you do? And I'm like, oh, you know, I, I, I worked for a radio station, or now it's even more hysterical. I do a podcast. They're like, oh, like they looked at me like I had eight heads that I could possibly talk about sports for three hours a day. I'm like, oh, there's plenty of stuff to talk about. Sure. So these are just reminders of those things. Honestly, they're just reminders of those things. That does not, that that number does not surprise me. I would, I would say this though, in the takeaway, those numbers should be alarm bells for a lot of people in our business who think the way to go is to keep getting narrower and narrower and narrower. No, you have to find a way to tap into the people who are the 61% that kind of know what's going on, but aren't living it every day and make it part of their routine, make it something that is part of their conversation. I guess also it depends on where you are. Yes. Right. Well, there's that too. Yeah. Let's think about it. Like, do you think the hurricanes have 15,000 season ticket holders at this point? Yeah. I forgot what the numbers are, but they're at record amounts. Yeah. Yeah. So 15,000 of the Raleigh population is 30%. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, if you have season tickets, you're obviously into, you don't fall into that category is what yeah, I'm getting yeah, at. I know what you're saying. You know what I, I mean? What like, saying. I also think like where we are, as we've talked about, college sports are pro sports. Mm -hmm. You know, you follow State, you follow Carolina, you follow Duke. Like, so to me, I feel like there might be a little bit more of a uniqueness, but I don't think it's there like, is. I don't think it's the other way though. Like, I don't think 60% are like hardcore. But if, if you were to say to me that a third of the people are not P1s, because mm -hmm. I feel like the 15 is probably right. 15% mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that is in this survey. But if you were to say to me that the number of people who are casual fans in this area is more closer to 45%, I would say. Okay. Okay. I'm with you on that. I'll have to look into it a little bit more, but I do find that I do find that interesting. <laughs> Big thanks to Mosquito Authority for sponsoring Ovias and Gilio. Check them out where uh, they got bugsbite.com as the website, Mosquito Authority, Pest Authority. I've mentioned they came out a couple of weeks ago to you know handle the mosquito spraying. They always ask any areas of concern. That customer service matters. Also, the fact that they don't have contracts matters as well. You want to keep working with them? They absolutely appreciate it, but they're not trying to lock you down. Hayes Lancaster, the OG, 
OG. His crew was out at my house yesterday. Outside treatment, under the house treatment, you name it, they've got it. Go to bugsbite.com, get those coupons, get some great deals. Word is bond when it comes to Hayes. They know how good their service is. They don't, they don't believe in contracts. Also, big thanks to Butcher's Market. Go check them out across the triangle. Also, a location out in Wilmington. They got the meats. They have uh, signature steak tips. I went with my charred jalapeno and garlic chicken last night for mm. Taco Tuesday. Big fan of that. And of course, they have all the accessories that you need, the seasoning, the charcoal, the, the wood to smoke, all that stuff to make your tailgate right. The weather's perfect right now for grilling outside. So head on over to the butcher's market. Get the sandwiches, man. Like Those you might not know at lunchtime, you go over there, get yourself a sandwich. I get it. Not all of the places have the fries. The fries are delicious. Yeah. I'm big on all the other products in the store. I can't wait to get you that hangover thing <laughs> on Thursday when we go over there for the uh, 919 Vice now podcast. Now about that. Joining us on the Heaster Automotive Group Hotline from the ACC Network, ESPN. He is West Durham. It's Wednesday. We haven't done a West Day in a while, Wes. What's a going on? Months. Now? It's been months since we've done a West Day. Last time I appeared on the show, I think I went Mike Bray style from a car at a Sheets <laughs> near the did. airport. You, were, you just got off a plane. I got off a plane. <laughs> Live from a rental car to Sheets. There's a sponsor. <laughs> I couldn't get to the breeze through. So no, therefore, no, no. Just, hey, careful yeah. now. We Couldn't get to the breeze through over we, off of uh, Edwards Mill, so maybe gotta, next time. Maybe next time. Hey, yeah. join us at the beer cave next time, Wes. I, you know what? I'm actually trying to figure out. You guys got to let me know next time. I'd like to come through the beer cave. Maybe we, we can do it during basketball. You, awesome. you know, Joe and I were actually joking about this because things are setting up for uh, quite a spectacle at the uh, Black Friday between North Carolina and Ooh. NC State. Yeah, they are. And we talked about this yesterday when we were – dissecting whether or not Dave Dorns entered the <laughs> Herb Sendick zone. <laughs> and <laughs> we'll talk about a uh, age determinant phrase. But anyway, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That's that, yeah. That'll click with an older person, yeah. younger person, not so much, but just, but you, which is why we added context. But I joked, I'm like, yeah, man, we got to do the show from the beer cave that night. If it's like a night game god. or something like that, and we could just invite Holy. people into the beer cave to oh vent. Oh my god! Right, like a microphone, people could just stop by, identify themselves. We're totally doing this. We're absolutely doing this <laughs> after the game. The, and maybe you know, if Hasselbeck, lose. maybe if Hasselbeck and Tyler and I get the game, we'll just swing by and do like a segment. Tim will break it down. You got Telestrator. Tim will hey, draw his own cover. Hey man, I'm worried about talking to Tim Hasselbeck, your, your your cohort there on the broadcast, because my dude's been dropping truth bombs in the middle of broadcast. He is not. He is not sugarcoating things, and I love it. Tell Tim yeah. I absolutely love the fact that he is calling it like he sees it. I love yeah. that in the broadcast. Yeah, he's uh, he's been great to work with. It's been uh, it's been a lot of fun. We've had great. We've had really good games for the most part, or at least dramatic games. Yes, you have. Uh, last Saturday night did not go as I thought it would go. It turned into a bit of a snoozer. Yeah. Um, who knew that Braden Narvison's school record field goal to eclipse Damon Hartman uh, <laughs> would, would be the highlight for the Wolfpack. But yeah. I tell you what, Joe, the thing about last Saturday night is, and I said this on the air, I don't think Duke gets enough credit for the physicality they play with, and I am really impressed with who they are defensively. And I told some people in Atlanta who are Florida State people, I said, if you think this is Ted Roof's Duke, mm -mm. you're sadly mistaken. If you think this is Barry Wilson Duke, you're sadly mistaken. This is a this is a Duke you've never seen. At least It's a Duke I've never seen. Let's put it that way. And I've, I've go all the way back to the late Mike McGee and he, him coaching Duke with Mike Dunn at quarterback, I, wow. even then I don't think they were that physical. Wow. They are a physical football team, really, on both sides of the ball. And it's a, it's a hell of a statement to Elko, by the way. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up this YouTube comment uh, from yesterday's show. And was, here's a question for you. Earlier today, Dabo doubled down on his, we're just a couple plays away from being undefeated. And earlier this week, a state-focused podcast said something to the effect of, if Duke doesn't get those two big plays, it's only 10-3. That's, that's big Jeff Bizdelic energy. Where is it? Our radio people told us that they, you take away those those runs, and we outscored it by 19. So, Yeah, no, we don't do that. And recall reading an NNO call. Wait, wait. Call, what, what? First of all, Stan Cotton, my friend since 1984, should never be looped into a Jeff Bizdelic 
comment my radio people told us. No, his name is Stan Cotton. He does the games with Mark Freidinger, Coach. Thanks. <laughs> Clown. <laughs> Shout out to the B-man. Anyway, uh, it was when I, what I saw Duke do is shut down and not showing their offensive hand. Two points. First offensive set, Duke. Yeah, anyway, 69 yards, blah, 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 sure. blah. The point is um, that you know, he says, like, even Prime admits he lost when he lost. I imagine Mr. Dorn owns losses, but gosh, give Duke credit, state fans. And I think this is a classic case anytime we talk about Duke is that we can't take Duke seriously ever, even 2013. I In 2013, when they went to the ACC championship game, Wes, I did not expect them to beat Florida State, but I saw a, a Duke team that was unafraid of Florida State. Florida State was just better. That was a physical game. Right. But the final score did not give you the full context. This squad under Mike Elko is even more difficult, which gets us to the Florida State game. This Duke Florida State game on Saturday. I think they're. I don't think they're going to win because they're going to at some point really need Riley Leonard's ability to break games open with his escapability. We don't know if Henry Billen the Fourth can do such things. I would say you're right. They need Riley Leonard to win the game. Mm -hmm. That's not. I'm not dismissing Henry Billen the Fourth. Because I think Henry Beelan is a talented guy who's got a big arm, okay? Sure. I mean, he showed it on the Calhoun throw. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, But the reality of it is this. They have to be at full tilt to beat Florida State. Because this is not Willie Taggart's Florida State, just like this is not Barry Wilson's Duke team, right? Mm -hmm. Or whoever. It doesn't – I mean, however you want to think of Duke. It's not your dad's Duke team. That's Right, it. right. So – in reality here, if Duke is full tilt and Florida State is full tilt, it could be a really good game. But to your measure a moment ago, Riley Leonard's going to have to do some Riley Leonard things for Duke to win the game. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, They're going to have to be sharp in the kick game. Todd Polino's come on for them nicely. They're going to have to be sharp in returns. They're going to be sharp in their uh, execution. That's the little things. are Because Florida State right now is showing you, oh, by the way, When's the last time we discussed Jordan Travis? It's been two weeks of Keon Coleman. It has been. Okay. Yeah. And, and oh, by the way, they're still rock solid on defense. That's, that's the issue with Florida State. We, we shouldn't be talking about Florida State like the dominant Knowles of the 90s, but we're not far from the team that won the national championship 10 years ago. We're also not far from probably those Florida State teams of the early 2000s before mm -hmm. the slide started. Let's, um, let's get into some midseason. Discussion, Wes. Okay. Your midseason coach of the year. Uh Elko. I would agree with you on that one. No. Elko with uh with Jeff Brom, not far behind. Jeff Brom would be in the discussion. What I think is going to be funny, uh, at some point, do we give Mac Brown credit for starting the season the way they've started? And yeah. looking pretty dominant outside yeah. of that app state game. Yes, you are. And I think Mac Brown, if they run it to the end, will be the coach of the year. Yeah. Yeah. However, right now, I mean, we picked Duke down. I think we picked them like sixth or seventh. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I don't remember the preseason poll. We had Carolina up. We had Florida State up. We had those teams up. So that's the deviant for me in terms of making that choice. Your midseason player of the year. You might have mentioned him already. Um, let's see. The Drake has been hot the last two weeks, Joe. The prop. So here's the thing with here's Drake the, thing came, with Drake. the Drake came out and put on a show Saturday night on ABC. What's funny about that game is he's he he actually had one of his worst games and he still dropped four touchdowns, which is hysterical to me. Right. Um, but and and I understood what North Carolina was trying to do in that game against Miami, and it presents problems going forward now that they have Tez Walker in the lineup, and it looks like Tez Walker is comfortable doing what he's doing. They got a sure. running game, they've got the skill position at the wide receiver group, and of course they have the quarterback, which is why. I think North Carolina is probably the most complete team right now, especially as the defense has been enjoying some turnover luck. Right. But Drake hasn't had. He's it's not going to. He's not going to have that year, Joe. He's it, not having me. that year. It's it, it all. It all comes down to what it's all. What do you want at a North Carolina season? Do you want Drake May Heisman hype and the highlights and all that stuff, but a record that doesn't go with it? Or do you want a Drake May who is absolutely fitting in for the that's, Chip Lindsay offense that's producing this records you have right now I, you you get the back end you're going to get the heisman piece yes. that's the part of college football's ecosystem that's now taken over here mm -hmm. um in in keon coleman you're getting a dominant player in two phases of the game 
Okay. He's a dominant return guy. He's a dominant receiver. Mm -hmm. Uh, there will be a lot of love for Jordan Travis if Florida State continues to be on this path. But right now, midseason player of the year, I would have no problem with Keon Coleman. Okay. I'm with you on that. I think I think it comes down to Keon Coleman or Drake May at this point. And uh, let's go to our, our friend David Hale. Uh, he, had, I guess, had done this on the ACC Network. Your non-affiliated MVP of the mid-year, would it be the Pitt sadness vase? Put your negative <laughs> thoughts into that vase, Wes. <laughs> Which, by the way, it worked. Worked. It the, worked. The Give Super no doozy weapon. credit. It worked. Pitt, the Pitt Super Weapon activated against Louisville, right? Yeah. Duke's visitor lockers. Because remember, Dabo was not happy about walking the length of a field to was get that a to post game thing. Dabo talked about again. It was that, a pre game thing. It was pre game, and he lost. Pre- yeah. And then they lost. Yes. Which yeah. is again the irony of of Dabo complaining about walking from the visitors' locker room. Versus a team that does every home game where they literally get on a bus, go around the stadium to go run down a hill is uh, speaking of carbon footprints. Exactly. They, they got to go electric bus, Wes. Yeah. Uh, bring Brom home, the hashtag. And then, of course, Miami's victory. That fight. would be mine. Yeah. Yeah. That would I, be mine. My dad was so pissed. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> pissed. So pissed. Hey, just tell your dad. Don't worry, dad. They could have done it. They could have started three plays before the end. <sighs> What's, you know, what's, what's funny about <laughs> <laughs> this actually gets us to a conversation back to North Carolina. Cause I've seen this a lot, right? You know, Joe and I talked at the beginning of the week about taking North Carolina's college football playoff chances seriously. Now I, I right. always, I always marked what they were going to do against Miami on Saturday night as the, the, the turning of the corner, like, all right, how serious are we going to take North Carolina? Mm-hmm. And it wasn't just that they won. It's how they won. That puts you into that, oh, okay, Carolina can do this. And their schedule is conducive to being undefeated by the time they get to that Duke game. Uh, With Virginia coming up, they've got Georgia Tech and they got Campbell. Although I want to get back to the Georgia Tech game in a second. Okay. The the Tar Heels are getting knocked for their strength of schedule. And I think people are seeing what they want to see. Right. And I, and I credit, I credit Carolina fans for going out there and doing these blind cases, right? Like, all right, here's team A, team B, team C. And what exposes, you know, you, you're picking the team that looks like it has a pretty decent strength of schedule, like no games against Sagarin teams in the hundreds or any of that stuff, FPI indexes and everything else. Right. North Carolina is actually looking better than Michigan's schedule at this point. North Carolina's yeah. schedule is looking better than Penn State's schedule at this point. Yet we look at Michigan as a national title contender, no questions asked, despite their schedule. And with North Carolina, we want to poke holes. I have a theory as to why we're there, and it has nothing to do with the ACC. I think it has everything to do with North Carolina and Mac Brown specifically uh, having the moment and then just kind of dropping off or having a having it blow up in their face. But you got to give Carolina credit, man, for what they've done so far this season. It's been impressive. It has been, and it's been noteworthy because it has come against a schedule that is reflective of kind of where college football is, right? You're playing without divisions, which number one's benefiting the ACC already mm-hmm. in its first year, and I guess only year of the three five five. Um, the other ideas that are really interesting to me is the league has walked themselves into this. Joe, don't okay. forget this is not a Carolina thing. This is because the ACC had a really good September. Yeah, and and don't get that part lost because this is what our friends in Birmingham have been leaning on for twenty years. <laughs> yes, of seriously. Course. Of course. I mean, it's funny here in the Atlanta area, as you can imagine, I cross-reference with a lot of people in the SEC. They've got nothing to say mm-hmm. because South Carolina has fallen on the abyss. Florida is inconsistent. Tennessee has a loss. A&M flashed. Kentucky looked bad the other night. It's, it's drink and Kirby in the East. That's where we are in mid-October in the SEC right now. It just means more, Wes. Just but see, more. but see, that's where we are with college football, though, because the Pac-12 and the ACC won September. Mm-hmm. They won September, and Carolina was at the front of the line. Why? Labor Day night or Labor Day weekend, they beat South Carolina. South Carolina, remember that was that riser in the East of the SEC. Gee, okay? Meanwhile, and now now Shane Beamer's out here breaking uh, breaking foots, kicking because, doors when you lose games. Doors, yeah, man, Bla- kicking doors, you blaming players with his perfect play calls, and then breaking his foot. I, I mean, mean, Shane's having a week, man. Yeah, I mean. I feel for Shane. I like Shane. We're sure, friends, but sure. 
I, but see, to me, that's where the counterculture of college football gets written is in September. Yeah. Do we, it's like saying, how about this? It's like saying that the ACC big 10 challenge used to count in the NCAA tournament room, <laughs> but that's what I mean. Yeah, we I talk it. about college basketball in November and December as if it impacts March. And we we use it. September as a measuring stick to determine November. It's not right. It's, Teams get better as the year go on. It's not right, but it also – the reason why it's not right for me is that it depends on who's doing the talking. That's what it always comes down to. It Completely depends on who's agree. doing the talking. Yep. And it gets back to one simple point that I've been banging the table on for years, and that is we've allowed the SEC to run the conversation. We've allowed that. We have right. no to blame but ourselves for those types of things because we just don't have that mindset – to just constantly be wearing the chess logo of the SEC all the time. This is not how right. they're wired. Uh, all right, before we let you go, um, back to North Carolina, that Georgia Tech game. I don't expect the I don't I don't expect a weird thing to happen against Virginia Tech or against Virginia this weekend. But it's a one score game going to the fourth quarter last year. True, and that's what's in the back of people's minds a lot, especially North Carolina fans. They're waiting for that kind of catastrophic game to happen when nobody expects it. I sure. don't expect it against Virginia. I think Georgia Tech is the true test as to whether or not this season is different for the Tar Heels. I don't disagree. I think Atlanta's always been a thorn. Uh, when I started doing Georgia Tech in 1995, Carolina came down there with a talented team. Mm -hmm. uh, four years later, they came back down there with a talented team in 99, and Ronald Curry tore his Achilles like in the second series of the game. Jeez. I mean, it, it's it's just out there in front of everybody. And I don't, Brent Key's got the right kind of team mentality wise. And Carolina, Carolina will have to defend the two way game. Now, Georgia Tech's not as talented as some of the teams Carolina's beaten, like the one they beat last Saturday. Mm -hmm. But Georgia Tech is a grinding football team. They make you work for everything. That's Key's mentality. He's, he's brought it through the full roster. They don't win the Miami game if they don't play with that mentality. It's right. that simple. Right. So, that makes but sense. I, I don't disagree with you. And I think I still believe the Friday after Thanksgiving, has got to have stuff on it because it's state Carolina in football and everything can happen. All right. We'll see you at the breeze through uh, beer cave then hand the mics. There it is. All right, Wes. See you guys. Big thanks to Western for hanging out with us today on Ovius and Gilio. and big thanks to wings over wings over Raleigh wings over Chapel Hill wings over Greenville. Every time we talk about college football, it's brought to you by wings over I hit them up on Saturday. Huge fan of the hot lemon pepper. I know people know this, but they've got so many, so many different flavor combinations. Great deals too, because, hey man, you get 50 wings, you want choices. Oh, because I've done the 50 wing, you know, having people over. 50, yeah, you name it. You never, you, what do you <laughs> mean? They it. got it. And it's like, oh, okay, you get the three flavors, you get all this kind of stuff too, but don't sleep on the tots, all right? I had these garlic Parmesan tots over the weekend. They were fantastic. I still haven't done the tendy in a bun, but that's on the list. I was just about to tell you, I've done the lobster roll, tender roll, lobster Ooh, roll. All right. Delicious. Yes. And again, you get the tenders in the same flavors. So, but you know me, I'm a hot guy. I'm I a know. sweet chili guy. I'm not the adventurous type, but remember our wings are better than your wings. So wings over is going to prove this to all you Buffalo transplants. November 7th out of PNC, the OG tailgate brought to you by wings over Ryan Malley, wings over.com free parking there and wings over Raleigh. On Hills Row Street, right across from UT. Order online, wingsover.com, and then go pick it up. Seriously, you're going to have a great tailgate. Also, big thanks to Breeze Through. Speaking of tailgates. Speaking of tailgate needs. Uh, okay, you get your wings. All right, well, now go get ice, your beer. Drinks, ice, all that kind Gatorade. of stuff. Head on over to Breeze Through. Uh, locations across the triangle, locations across the state. Breeze Through's got you covered uh, for your tailgate needs. Hey, how about the busiest you, time. How about if you've made it this far into the podcast? You leave a message right now. Yeah. Right now. On the YouTubes, and we will, we you will win the Breeze Through Lifetime Tumblr. Okay, right now. Yeah, I think there's a way to timestamp in the comments. No, no, they'll, be, they'll just be the first person who leaves a comment. We can see. Well, the, the timestamp, but, they, but they, want, they have to say they want the. Tumblr. Yeah, here's the code word. Um, <laughs> I want the Tumblr. <laughs> no, I gotta give them. A, I gotta give them a, a code word. Uh huh. Coaches, coaches is the code word. <laughs> see how you spell it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair enough. First person with coaches in the comments gets the tumbler. Yeah. It's yours. All right. Thanks all to right. our friends at Breeze Through. Lifetime refills, of course, but all of your tailgate needs.
All right, let's get out of here on some Hey Joe questions. Brought to you, you know by... I love the Easter egg. I know you do. Yeah. You're seeing if it's people a reward. Are, you're seeing if people are paying attention. Totally get that. Totally get that. Speaking of paying attention, um, Oakwood Pizza Box. Shout out to them. It's Wednesday. It's Wednesday. They're open. We're good to go. We'll get, but we're not going to do traditional Hey Joe questions because I feel like I can, I can ask my own Hey Joe questions for a couple of these things. Okay. Did you know that yesterday they had not the first, not the second, not the third, but the 10th congressional hearing on name, image, and like this yesterday? 10th. 10th. Yes, I, Tenth. I, I, I did. Uh, shouts to Eric Prisbal on, on three covering a lot of this. So, yeah, yeah. R- Ross Dellinger uh, also covering a lot of this. And some of the things that I saw out there were just pretty damn funny. So let's let's start with Lindsey Graham. Oh, boy. This is from Ross Dellinger. Lindsey Graham, quote, Utah is offering everybody on the team a new truck. There is no end to this between the portal and IL. College football is in absolute chaos. Now, look, dude, there's context about that Utah truck deal. It's a lease. Did, have you seen the pictures of the trucks? I have not. They're wrapped in the dealership's oh, okay. logo. So it's basically advertising. Yeah. They get their own OG but, mobile. Essentially, yes. <laughs> I understand. I'm, I'm surprised Heaster hasn't given us one yet, if we're being real. Uh, Dellinger, of course, I'm showing it on YouTube, by the way, or on, on the YouTube uh, channel right now. Dellinger actually shows you the Utah truck. Yeah. All right. There are six-month leases. They're tied to the athletes' enrollment as well. They're not just handing out trucks. Also, this business about it's absolute chaos. Man, college football ain't sucking right now. Have you seen the ratings? College football is like at an all-time high in terms of level of interest. To, to tie it back to who's into what, watching things closely, again, it's paying off for college right now. Ratings are, are pretty high right now. All right. Next one from Ross Dellinger, which I thought was, again, showing you how unserious uh, we are with a couple of these things. Here is uh, Josh Hawley. A lot of questioning so far, and I'm hearing the Middle East and transgender athletes. Do we are an un we are an unserious country, man? We really are. Meanwhile, what else we got here? We got, oh Joe Manchin, Joe Manchin on college sports. Quote: If it's all about chasing the dollar, that's not what this was designed to be. Has Joe seen what the conferences are doing? Does Joe does does Joe know that the Pac-12 is dead? Because of the chasing of the dollar, not the athletes. It's not the athletes who killed the Pac-12. It's not the athletes who who killed them. It was the adults who were chasing the dollar. If that's it, then you know, go from high school to the pros. Of course, as Ross Dellinger points out, there's rules against that. But this is again code words, dog whistles. What's the issue here? Are young black players making money? It's not what it was designed. That's to be. not what this should be. We do. We cannot stand that. Never mind that the NCAA was created, literally, yeah, in the early 1900s because people were coming back from the war and playing for one Ivy League team one week and then being paid to play for another Ivy League team the next week. Yep. This was before integration, sir. Yeah, <laughs> just so you know. Well, look, shout out to Bamani Jones. He always says the goal is to keep him broke. Joe yes. Manchin clearly on that. And Jack Swarbrick giving the game oh. away. Here's Notre Dame's AD. Quote, <laughs> we will wind up with a series of rulings that declare students as employees and create an unstable, uns- unsustainable <laughs> difference state to state. Ding, 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 ding. They do not want players to become employees. Because they don't want to share in the revenue that the players create for them. No. And uh, I forgot who it was. I didn't, I, I didn't see the quote out there. Oh, also um, the new and the Charlie Baker was also saying, look, man, we need antitrust exemption. So we can't, so we can make sure they're not becoming employees. They're giving the game away. So that right. at least we, I, I credit them for that. But I think it was a collective member that straight up said, because the collectives were the ones that were on display yeah. at this congressional hearing. And they said, look, I don't understand why all of college sports has to answer for the issue that is specific to college football. Like making college football players employees does not mean that the rest of the yeah. athletic department has to follow the same boat. Yep. Why can't you? You already separate football as it is. Yes, they so do. So why not just keep it that's keep it separate? Keep the butter and the chocolate away from each other, right? Or actually, butter and chocolate. You make pies that way. Maybe that's not the best analogy. And we'll close on this. You ever seen that meme from The Onion where like the worst person you know makes great point? <laughs> oh, no. You've seen that one? Oh, no. You've seen that one, You're right? about to do this to me. But have you seen that one? I have. Okay. Yes. Ted Cruz. Oh, no. Like many of the general public, does not understand targeting, and it pisses me <laughs> off when his teams are penalized for this. In the congressional hearing. He said that in a congressional hearing, and I'm like, <laughs> damn it! Damn it! Am I going to sit here and go, you know what? Ted Cruz is right! 
Ugh. Man. Speaking of unserious people, but I agree with him. That's going to wrap it up for today's show. <laughs> we'll see you Thursday. Mm-hmm.